Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show, Dr. David Halpern. He heads up Whitehall's Nudge Unit, which is the first government institution that uses behavioral economics to influence human behavior. Now, David, I have to tell you, this sounds a little bit like a conspiracy theory that the government is trying to control us. Are you, in fact, the guy who's controlling us? Uh, sadly, I don't have all those levers in my hand, but, um, but you're right. Actually, of course, governments are always interested, if not in controlling people, and certainly interested in influencing them. So um, governments are in that you know game, and that's how it is, um, right? Okay, so you use the word nudge, which I guess is a nicer way of saying influence. Uh, is that just a, a lower level of influencing people? Well, governments have long used certain kinds of tools, notably they use legislation and laws and they hope that passing a law will somehow influence people's behavior. And um, they often use financial instruments, taxes and incentives. But we're trying to add into the armory a set of other kinds of approaches which are more behaviorally nuanced, you know, resting essentially on yeah, sometimes known as nudges because they don't have to necessarily use such heavy sanctions as a law or you know, mandating or a, a fine or a sanction. So legislation or major economic policy is like trying to hit to solve the problem with a sledgehammer and you're saying that maybe some of the problems the government's trying to solve can be handled a little bit more delicately yeah that's right or actually although everybody calls us the nudge unit a lot of it is really about trying to introduce a more realistic model of human behavior into all the things that governments do so if you are going to use a financial incentive well what's the best way of doing it do you do it in one lump or do you do it up front or you know in what way would you tailor it or even if you're going to pass a law to what extent does the law work because Parliament has passed it and it's in the courts versus it's because people know what that rule or regulation is and they self-enforce it. But yeah, often it's very light touch. It can be things which governments weren't traditionally very interested in, like the way in which a form is written or the way in which something is word, worded or said can also, it turns out, to be incredibly consequential for people's behavior. And you've done studies around the world. Have you found that different cultures react to the same stimuli differently? Well, there's some differences, but actually, I think in some ways it's more striking how great the similarities are. Look, let's face it, if we go back to 2010, a lot of us were doubtful as to whether bringing the evidence from North American universities often developed on North American undergraduates would work in London, let alone anything else. Um, but I think we obviously have found that actually a lot of that stuff was extremely effective. And since then, we have been approached by many other governments to help. And we often found the same sorts of effects. I mean, I'll give you a concrete example to bring it to life. So one of the early results was, which attracted a lot of attention was adding one line onto um, the letters sent to le late taxpayers saying, most people pay their tax on time. And in fact, most people pay their tax on time. And you're one of the few who've yet to get around to doing it. <laughs> and this greatly yes. increases repayment rates because it's using social norms. Uh -huh. Anyway, a little while ago, we were asked by the World Bank to help in Guatemala. Now, Guatemala has what's euphemistically known as low tax morale, um, which you can obviously figure out what mm -hmm. that means. Um, and so anyway, we did an intervention, very similar one. We tried a number of different um, operations. It was quite hard to find the right kind of stat or which would be most people paying their tax in Guatemala. But we found this tax where 61 percent of people paid. Anyway, we found that using very similar kinds of approaches led to a four or five fold increase in the number of people who who paid their tax in response to this um, cue. So pretty similar. It looks like human beings across the world often influenced by quite similar factors. So let's say, well, let me ask you a question. My day job is that I'm a financial advisor and I work with people developing long term financial plans. I talk about saving and investing and asset allocation, uh, the type of stuff that frankly would bore some people to death. But other people are not necessarily excited about the details, but they are excited about the ultimate goal, which could be becoming wealthy or retiring at a certain age. But I feel a large part of my job is nudging people to do the right thing. And yet a lot of times I face, you know, a lot of pushback. If I as a as a financial advisor or as a minister of finance wanted to encourage people to save a little more, what sort of tools would be available to do that to kind of get people on the right track? Right. Well, of course, governments have now, as you probably know, having spoken to some of the other behavioral kind of scientists across the world, I think, um, that uh, making it easy is the most straightforward and important thing to do. So it was often presumed that Anglo-Saxons didn't really want to save more um, in terms of their pensions, famously, um, and governments have been spending literally tens of billions, in some cases hundreds of billions of dollars on encouraging people to save more. 
Um, whereas we know, for example, in the UK in 2012, we changed from an opt-in to an opt-out system. And pretty much overnight, those people who are covered, you'd find more than 90 percent um, started saving for pensions, particularly those on low income and younger people. So make it easy, of course, to advise at a government level, but it's also true in terms of financial advisor. What can you do to help someone on a regular basis, encourage them to put aside the money in a way that's not effortful? Um, you can do other things. You know, you can be playful. Why, why isn't saving more fun, right? Um, and financial products often don't seem to do that. Um, so in Britain, we've had for 300 years, actually, a particular product, which is essentially a lottery-based um, saving product. And a lot of governments think, well, why don't we do that more, more widely, for example? Anyway. We're talk we were talking with Dr. David Halper, and he wrote a, a fascinating book called the, called the Inside the Nudge Unit, How Small Changes Can Make a Big Difference. And David, I want to dive a little more into what you were talking about, because I, I think maybe we can get a real takeaway in helping people to encourage them to save. And uh, one of the things you're describing, which is make it easy, uh, certainly is something that, that we will tell people, and I think it does lead to success, like tell your bank or your brokerage firm to automatically withdraw X number of dollars or pounds every month and put it into a savings scheme, and that does seem to be a good way to do it. And even in choosing investments, a lot of times, you know, I'll find if a, if a client has to be involved in making the buy and sell decisions, mm -hmm. then inertia will often stop him from making any decision. But if he can automate it, like put it into a mutual fund or a managed account, it may not be the world's best investment, and no one knows for sure, but at least it's being done, which I guess is a huge step ahead, and that goes with your making it easy. But how can you make it playful? <laughs> it doesn't sound that much fun. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a, a, a colleague, and we work with sometimes Peter Tofano, who's at Oxford, who feels quite strongly about this, has written that we could make it playful. So in the UK, as I said, you know, for 300 years, we've had these things. Now, um, there is premium bonds, which are um, a financial product which pays out... Um, as a lot on a lottery basis. So instead of it going through as interest, it's quite literally playful in that sense. Um, it's become something rather curiously that people think of a slightly old fashioned, something your grandmother would buy. But actually, well, why not? Why is it so easy to buy a lottery ticket, but relatively hard to buy a financial product, which has got some of that same dynamic, which is literally fun and playful in that sense. Um, so if we can lower the cost of doing that, it's a pretty powerful uh, tool potentially. Mm -hmm. Let me just note before I move on to the next question, if you are an American, the word premium bond means something totally different from what, <laughs> from what David is describing here. <laughs> you've also done research about charity, and I, I've read some of the really the fascinating ideas that you've come up with. One of the things I've always I've encouraged people to give 20% of their income to charity, and the lo my logic has been, and now I'm beginning to wonder about based on your research, my logic was that if people give away money or they feel they have to give away the money because they want to feel they have to give it away, it, they end up looking at money in a different way. They're less greedy. It's less about the money but more about what good the money can do. What tools have you found that can help to encourage a society to become more charitable? Yes, well, the Prime Minister was very interested in that. Um, by the way, before we get into the detail, it's worth noting, as you might know, Liz Dunn's work from Canada, which shows very powerfully that giving away money is one of the best things you can do to make yourself really happy and satisfied, and that mm -hmm. people systematically underestimate that um, that how positive they feel about it. It's a very powerful, interesting result, which has been seen across more than a hundred countries now, very well demonstrated. So, um, so that's against that kind of positive background. Well, why don't people give more and so on? Um, and what can you do again to make it easy? So we have done you right a number of interventions. Some of them have been very playful. So we did a, a, a trial trying to get investment bankers to give a day of their salary to charity and good causes, which, by the way, turns out to be quite a lot of money. <laughs> anyway. Um, so just asking them and having the CEO send you an email and get a leaflet and so on leads to about 5% of people giving a day of their salary. Um, adding some volunteers into the mix and so on doesn't really make much difference. On the other hand, when you give them the leaflet, if you include with it a little tiny tub of sweets, it more than doubles the proportion of these investment bankers who give a day of their salary. Wow. In fact, more recently we found even more powerfully, so that takes you from 5 to sort of 12% plus, if you get a requ um, an, an email from someone you know in the firm who says why they give to this charity and encourages you to think and, and talk to others about it and the impact it can have, that increases levels of giving by about sevenfold, up to more than 30%, 30% plus giving. That's, to that's because there's some sort of social acceptance, you mean? 
Or yeah, it's a social nudge. We're very influenced by what, but also someone that you know. Um, I mean, other ways of doing it, there was interest a campaign run actually about um, encouraging people to give in terms of their wills, bequests. It wasn't 20% in your number, but it was at least 10%. And you could sort of feel the wheels of the Treasury turning. How big a tax subsidy would we have to give to make those numbers move? <laughs> Pretty scary. So we thought, well, while they're trying to figure that out, why don't we look at what's a timely intervention? Well, who writes wills? Lawyers. Why don't we do a trial with some lawyers who are a very big firm who write a lot of wills? So can we just, you know, look at your script and just suggest the insertion of a question along the lines of, you know, are there any charities or causes that you're really passionate about? Many people, you know, do choose to give. Anyway, this leads to a threefold increase in the number of people who then add a bequest in their will and a doubling in the size of that bequest, so a six-fold increase in the level of giving, just wow, asking amazing. at the right time. <laughs> amazing. I, interesting what you said about gifts, which is, uh, it sort of touched on me. You said to give, a, to give away a, a, some sweets. My neighbor did some renovations, and it was for months. They were banging and drilling, and it was terribly, terribly annoying. And then as they were finishing up their their uh, contractor, the, the guy who was in charge of it, came and delivered a beautiful plant to all the neighbors around. The plant probably cost about $20. And, and I felt much, much better towards them after months <laughs> of suffering. I mean, this was not a little thing. And I think that the, the concept is that it's not that you need to necessarily pay someone an equivalent amount, but you need to show some sort of honor or respect, which can get people to come over to your side. Is, is that kind of the feeling? That's right. Um, so, in fact, you touch on a, corner of a very deep and important idea. So on the one hand, you can use these sort of nudge approaches for make a change to a letter or something. But actually, it also can give you profound insights about how, you know, what makes human beings tick. Um, so much of our lives and the, and the economy and society is, in fact, driven by exactly the dynamic you described. Sometimes, in fact, by the Israeli economic historian Avner Offer as um, the, the, the economy of regard which are transactions which are not necessarily of economic value and they can be spaced in time. But that is what makes a lot of the world operate. And in fact, if you monetize the value of looking after our kids and doing all these other things, it's normally more than GDP per capita. It often, in fact, drives the real economy um, as well as um, is so consequential for your well-being. So, yes, of course, what your neighbor did is they're giving an act of reciprocity. It gets your oxytocin, by the way, flowing. You feel good when someone reciprocates um, uh, in that kind of way. And also in um, Danny Kahneman's famous early work, it also is a recency effect. So we we don't remember the past very clearly, but we do remember the most recent thing that happened. So it's surprising how that last act will blot out much of the intervening pain. Right. So we will leave off our discussion on that last idea so that people will remember that they should give <laughs> gifts to their friends or enemies and maybe solve that problem. David, we are just about out of time. But in the last few seconds, tell us, how can people follow you, follow your work and get a copy of your fabulous book? Well, I hope the book is available more widely. It's certainly available in the UK now. Um, uh, on the Behavioral Insights team site, we put a lot of our results out and we try and share them for the world. We do think, my, my own view and just concluding comment, as governments and more and more governments in, across the world, including in Israel and elsewhere, look at these approaches. It's really important, I think, that, the, that we be very open about these behavioral approaches and the experimental sort of style they bring as well. Absolutely. I think that's very true. And David, we will put a link to your website at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. David Halpern, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. You are listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. But if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or on, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.